Peace be with you. Welcome to the Institute of All Intelligent Life. My name is Ali Muhammad Kartar Puri, also known as Alan Kiesler. And uh, I've decided this morning to continue my uh, class that I had yesterday um, because I like to read a little bit from the Holy Quran, the Holy Bible, the Dhammapada, and the Bhagavad Gita every morning. So I thought, why not share it with my Facebook friends <laughs> and followers? So <clears throat> that's why I'm back online again. I usually have do this only on Saturday and Sunday, but I've decided to come on on Monday too, maybe other days as well. Um, so I'm going to just continue reading uh, in each of those four scriptures from where I had randomly opened uh, when I uh, started this on Saturday morning. And then I read it the same verses yesterday. And now we will just continue in each of those four books, reading after where we read yesterday. Um, so in the Holy Quran, we are reading uh, from Surah 26, the poets. Uh, and we had come up to verse 5 yesterday. So today we will reach, uh, we will read Verse 6. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. They have indeed rejected the message, so they will soon, excuse me, so they will know soon enough the truth of what they mocked at. So this is a warning. <laughs> um, for those who reject the guidance of God, which comes to us all the time, but we even we get the guidance of God in our own hearts. Uh, we get the guidance of God through holy scriptures. We get the guidance of God from saints and holy people. And uh, here, God is warning us that uh, if we reject the truth that God is giving us, uh, we will know soon enough what the truth is, <laughs> that we were foolish to reject that truth. So this, of course, as we said yesterday, is very common. In fact, it's usual in this world that when people get guidance from God, they reject it. Very sad state, but it's an unfortunate fact that people tend to reject the guidance that God gives us. At least at first we do. And maybe after some time, soon enough, <laughs> the Holy Quran says, soon enough we'll see the truth. And then, of course, as we were discussing yesterday, the verse from the Dhammapada, we will uh, burn like fire is burning us. We will feel such regret and anxiety. So it's better to accept God's guidance, even if it's maybe something we don't like um, for whatever reason. It's better to be humble and try to understand uh, that God can give us guidance all the time, anyway, in any form, <laughs> in any, through any procedure. Uh, God does give each one of us guidance in our hearts also. So we should listen to that guidance too. Uh, and try to not follow the path that most people unfortunately follow, which is to initially reject that guidance if it doesn't suit our desires. All right, we'll go on and read from the Holy Bible, the next verses after the verse we read yesterday, verses we read yesterday. This is the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse, verses 5 and 6. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance, they had the form of men, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Wow, so this is continuing the description uh, of the fire that uh, Ezekiel 
described that he saw coming uh, out of the north in a great wind and a great cloud which was shining and uh, there was this fire uh, in the midst of that cloud in the wind and here today we are reading how from the midst of that fire uh, four living creatures came who looked sort of like human beings, but obviously were not, <laughs> because they each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. So um, I'm going to take this. I, I actually had not prepared what I'm going to say at all. I just uh, now read this verse, uh, these two verses, as I was preparing this class a few minutes ago. Um, but I just realized... <laughs> This is a wonderful opportunity to talk about extraterrestrials because these beings that Ezekiel saw uh, certainly are extraterrestrials. That is, they are not human beings, they are of some other species, and they have four wings and four faces. So you may say, oh, this is just a vision or it's not really a real reality. Of course, visions are <laughs> realities also. They may be more real than the world that we live in. <laughs> How do we know? <laughs> so uh, there certainly are many, many different types of creatures uh, from many, many different planets. Uh, you may say these creatures came from heaven, but where is heaven? Heaven could be in another dimension, but heaven could also be referring to other planets in this dimension. So there may be different types of heavens. In fact, according to most religious traditions, uh, there are seven heavens. Some say more than that, but at least seven divisions of heaven. So that could be different dimensions. So some extraterrestrials live in the same dimension that we live in, and uh, others live in other dimensions. Um, but the most fascinating thing that uh, actually... Uh, of course, this has not been publicized, but there are many, many uh, space uh, voyages which uh, for almost 100 years now, for at least 85 or 90 years, human beings have actually been traveling into space. This has been kept a secret. Um, but the Germans began this back in the 1930s even. Uh, they began traveling out into space. They learned the technique of building what we now call flying saucers, and they began traveling. They traveled to the moon, even in the 1930s, and to Mars and beyond. And after the end of the Second World War, before the end of the Second World War, they had been doing these voyages out into space, and they uh, continued them. They moved, actually. They're from Germany. The Nazis moved to uh, Antarctica, their, their base. They had created some... Uh, big under-the-ice bases in Antarctica. They continued their space exploration from there. And the United States also learned many of the German scientists uh, were brought by the CIA to the United States, and they continued the, the, the same space travel uh, long before <laughs> Alan Armstrong and, uh, and uh, Aldrin went to the moon in 1969. The Americans actually also went to the moon uh, in the 1950s, I'm quite sure. Um, and then they also went to Mars and beyond to uh, different planets in our solar system and even to other star systems. Uh, so this, of course, has all been kept secret, but this is actually going on. And the most astonishing thing to many of these astronauts and to the scientists that were studying extraterrestrial life is that almost all, maybe not almost all, but most, uh, of these extraterrestrials have a form very much like our form, very much like a human form, just like Ezekiel is describing these extraterrestrial creatures as having a human-like form. Um, of course, they had four wings and four <laughs> faces, but basically uh, a head, two arms, two legs, uh, and a face with eyes, generally two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and two ears. This is a very, very widespread form throughout uh, not only our solar system, 
in our galaxy, but even other galaxies, they uh, were shocked actually to discover that most living beings have a human-like form. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot we have to learn. <laughs> this may be shocking and we may reject it, but I request you all to kindly pray and meditate and look in your heart and see maybe this is possible. Maybe it really has been going on for almost a hundred years. Human beings have been traveling out into space and it's just been kept very, very secret, but gradually uh, this truth is coming out. All right, we will continue. Yudhamapada. <clears throat> And we are continuing in chapter 10 of the Dhammapada. Uh, we will read verses 9 through 12, because I was going to read just verse 9, but you will see that it really requires us to read through verse 12. Um, he who with the rod harms the rodless and harmless soon will come to one of these states. He will be subject to acute pain, disaster, injury, or even grievous sickness, or loss of mind, or oppression by the king, or heavy accusation, or loss of relatives, or destruction of wealth, or ravaging fire that will burn his house. Upon the dissolution of the body, such unwise man will be born in hell. Another warning. <laughs> Here it's not about rejecting the message of God, it's about harming harmless people. That is very, very dangerous thing to do. Of course, we see it happening all over the world today, especially in Kashmir and Palestine, um, <clears throat> but we see it all over the world, where powerful people who have some rod, they have some <laughs> weapon, or they have some power, to control other people, and they harm them. The harmless people, the innocent people, are being horribly mistreated. Uh, so here we are receiving a warning. If we ever do that, we will suffer grievously. We will suffer probably worse than the suffering we're causing, but certainly at least as bad. Uh, and uh, after the death of this body, we would be born in hell. It's a very clear warning. There is such a place, or there are such places. <laughs> in the West, especially, many people don't even believe in hell. Um, but there definitely is some condition or state of being after leaving this body, which is very, very painful. I've actually been there, believe it or not. You may not believe me, but I've been to a hellish place uh, <clears throat> I was surprised when I went was transported there because it wasn't a burning fire like I was expecting. This is what I was taught as a child and what I mostly believed, that hell is a burning fire. And I guess it is a burning fire in the sense of uh, the same sense that we were just reading yesterday here. Uh, I'm just going to go back and read that verse again. So when a fool does wrong deeds, he does not realize their evil nature, by his own deeds, the stupid man is tormented like one burnt by fire. So the burning, the regret, uh, is like burning in fire in hell. <clears throat> but the place where I was taken, uh, it was actually cold, if anything. It was dark and damp. And uh, there were people, they were moaning. Uh, it was very, very pitiful, very, very heart-wrenching. Uh, and what I found was that the people were absorbed in themselves. It was uh, hard to even get their attention, to make them realize that I was there with them. They were totally, uh, you know, they were inwardly lamenting, burning in, in uh, regret and anxiety about the things they had done. And I actually uh, observed this. I saw this myself. Many, many people. It was like... It was almost like they were drowning in quicksand. That was the way it, it felt. They were <clears throat> So there definitely are such places, such hellish places. And the Dhammapada here is also warning us, <laughs> don't be
be foolish. Don't harm the harmless, or you are going to suffer grievously. Very good warning. <laughs> we should share this warning with the Narendra Modi and the Indian security forces who are horribly treating the harmless people in Kashmir. And we should warn Mr. Netanyahu and the Israelis who are horribly harming the Palestinian people. And of course, uh, there are many, many places in the world where harmless people are being harmed. So this is going to be the result uh, that those people who are causing that harm and pain to those innocent people are going to suffer. It's true. We should warn them. All right, finally, we come to the Bhagavad Gita, and we're simply going to read the next verse again after we read yesterday. We were in chapter 5, verse 12. Now we come to verse 13. When the embodied living being controls his nature and mentally renounces all actions, he resides happily in the city of nine gates, the material body, neither working nor causing work to be done. Wow. This is a very, very deep statement. Um, I mean, the Bhagavad Gita is an amazing book. It's full of these sorts of very, very profound statements, which may be even contrary to our usual thinking. Um, but I'm going to read it again because it's so deep, this idea. When the embodied living being, that means us, <laughs> controls his nature and mentally renounces all actions. So when we, he means he or she, when any of us uh, gain control of our mind, uh, we have been reading about the necessity to control the mind also, both from the Bhagavad Gita, I think in the Dhammapada also last week. Um, when we are able to mentally renounce all actions, this is deep. We think that we are doing everything that we are doing, that our bodies are doing. But uh, actually we should renounce all actions. We, that means, it doesn't mean we don't do any actions, but it means we step back and we can detach ourselves. We should realize, uh, the Bhagavad Gita is instructing us, that we are not actually doing those actions ourselves. We should just step back and observe them and not become entangled uh, in them. As the verse we read yesterday, that one who is greedy uh, for the fruits of their labor, uh, who is not in union with the divine, become entangled, uh, become caught up uh, in the results of their actions. But here we're giving, being given a very, very profound instruction. What is that? To step back Mentally renounce all action. Just observe what is going on. Why? Uh, because then we will reside happily within this body, which is called the city of nine gates. Uh, neither working nor causing work to be done. This is very, very deep stuff. <laughs> we have to uh, meditate. We have to meditate to realize the truth of this teaching. And we can do it. As I've often recommended, take a deep breath. <laughs> Just breathe deeply. That helps us, the mind, become peaceful. It helps us step back from being entangled in this world and everything that's going on and thinking, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm accomplishing this. Actually, we can't accomplish anything. Only by the mercy of God can anything happen. So if we accomplish something, it's actually God's strength that is enabling that to be accomplished. Um, so, what does it mean, neither working nor causing work to be done? Uh, it means that the material nature, actually, the Bhagavad Gita explains that elsewhere. The material nature is what is doing all of this. Prakriti kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvasha ahankar vimudhatma kartaham iti manyate. The material nature, uh, prakriti, is doing all of these actions. And the fool thinks, I'm the doer. Ahankar means false ego, pride. Ahankar, vimudhatma means a fool, it means an ass, literally. 
kartaham iti manyate. He thinks, or she thinks, I am doing this. Hmm? So, actually, we're not doing these actions that our bodies are doing. We are thinking we're doing them, but they're being carried out uh, under the direction of God, of course, by the material nature. So this is a deep idea, and it requires some meditation, some detachment uh, to look at s and uh, observe things uh, instead of just becoming totally entangled in them. Well, this is a very profound idea, and it, it, it actually uh, requires a lot of meditation to realize this. For most people, of course, some people have already realized it to some extent, and immediately they can see, oh yes, it's true. You can actually do this. You can actually step back and just observe what's going on, and you'll be able to detach your consciousness from the mental activities. It's not only what the body's doing, it's what the mind is doing. You can step back and observe the actions of the body. You can observe the actions of the mind. And uh, when you can actually detach yourself like that, you will become happy and peaceful. You will simply be observing uh, how wonderfully uh, God is doing everything through the agency of material nature, how everything is being carried out. There's a perfect plan for everyone. Uh, but because we have desires, the Dhammapada explains this also very beautifully, uh, it's because we have desires that we think we're doing. We want to do something, so we think we're doing it. But actually, in response to our desires, no doubt. So in that sense, uh, we are working. It's, uh, we're causing work to be done only indirectly. We're not actually directly working. But because of our desires, uh, our desires are being fulfilled by the material nature under the direction of God. And that... <laughs> it's a very, very amazing thing to realize when you can actually do this, when you can step back and see that I'm not doing this. Uh, this is God's arrangement. And uh, when we can do that, hukum rizai chalna nana kalikiana. How do we come free? Uh, this is Guru Nanak's beautiful statement. Hukum rizai chalna nana kalikiana. How do we become free from this entanglement? We simply become satisfied with the order of God. We act peacefully and happily, accepting the order of God. And what is the result of that? Uh, when one sees that the order of God uh, is the superior, it, it is actually determining what is happening. Uh, whether one is elevated or degraded, or whether one is rich or poor, <laughs> whatever happens, it's actually according to the order of God. And one who understands this, hukum, the hukum of God, the order of God, one who understands this, no longer will have a uh, false ego. Haumi uh, There will no longer be this false ego. So that's exactly uh, what we are reading about here in the Bhagavad Gita. That if we renounce the activities, the false ego, the false idea, I'm the doer, see how great I am, I've done this, I've done that, I've accomplished this, no. <laughs> then we will give up. No, that, that person will no longer uh, have this false idea that I'm the doer. Actually, God is the doer. All right. So I'm going to see if we have any comments or questions. I see there are some. Salim Akhtar asks, How are you, sir? I'm okay, thank you. I have had some back pain, but it's a little better now. I've been doing some exercises and walking. <laughs> the doctor actually said the best exercise is just to walk for all, <laughs> especially for back pain. So I've been doing that, and I'm much better, thank God. Uh, Khadija Zahid says, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Khadija ji. 
Musabi SM Ali also says, Salaam Alaikum, peace be to you also. Abdul Jabbar Dogar, always beautiful. Uh, Imtiaz Shadad Kot Wala. Shadad, Shadad Kot Wala. I've been to Shadad Kot. <laughs> Shadad Kot in Sindh is a very nice town. Uh, says very nice. Your town is also very nice, Imtiaz Sahib. Uh, let's see. Okay, now we have a good question. Khadija Zahid asks, why would these people keep space travel and extraterrestrials a secret? Oh, very, very good question. You're very intelligent, Khadija, to ask such a <laughs> good question. Uh, and it's a very, very important thing to understand. <clears throat> there are a variety of reasons. One obvious reason is that these extraterrestrials use a technology to do their space travel based on what we call zero-point energy or free energy. And that is that, uh, although of course our modern scientists may not know about this, or those who do, they don't talk about it, and those who do talk about it get suppressed or even killed. It's in fact happened. People who have developed this free energy technology, and quite a few people have, uh, they've been suppressed. Their laboratories have been destroyed, literally, uh, and some of them have been killed. By who? By the people that don't want humanity to understand that energy is available everywhere. <laughs> Why? Because if we find out, we won't have to purchase oil anymore. And all these multi-billion or trillion dollar businesses, the energy businesses, which depend on electric power lines <laughs> and uh, petrol, gasoline or fuel, all these companies will be out of business. So they are desperately trying to prevent humanity from finding out about free energy because they will not be able to control humanity so easily anymore. Uh, they control us uh, by making us dependent on them. So actually, extraterrestrials know that within the very fabric of space itself, there's a lot of energy, uh, even much more than nuclear energy. So. Uh, Anyone with a little device, it uh, is not actually that expensive. It could be built, and they have been built for a few hundred dollars even. Anyone in, any, in every house or every village, uh, they can have one of these machines and they can generate energy, which can be used uh, for electrical purposes, for heating or cooking. Or <laughs> um, but the powers that be, we can say, they want to control us, and they control us by forcing us to depend on them. Uh, by their energy supply, so they are desperate to prevent humanity from finding out about this zero-point energy technology. So that's one of the main reasons why they've decided to keep all of this information about extraterrestrial secret. There are many other reasons also. <laughs> that's just one of the easiest ones to understand, the way our world works, where economics is such a big factor. Uh, selfish people want to continue making all that money. Uh, find out about this uh, free point, a uh, free zero-point energy technology. So that's one reason. Uh, other reasons are <laughs> some of the bad extraterrestrials don't want us to find out about them because they are actually trying to control us and the easiest way to control us is for us to not even know about them. It's just like Satan. Uh, Satan is also an extraterrestrial. <laughs> Maybe not even a sort of conscious being like we think of, but uh, sort of we might call an artificial intelligence or an extraterrestrial intelligence. But Satan is definitely a real uh, being, a real existence, but he has been very expert in fooling humanity into thinking there is no such thing as Satan. Therefore, how can we fight him? If we don't think he exists, we can't fight him very well. So that's exactly the same program of those evil extraterrestrials who uh, are the ones who actually gave the Nazis this technology. Um, and kept it secret, of course, uh, because they don't want us to know that they are actually existing at all, so they can control us. That's another very important reason why all of the space travel and extraterrestrials has been kept a secret. Um, there are other reasons, too, but those are two big reasons. Um, they're all in cahoots, we might say. <laughs> the evil extraterrestrials 
and many of the secret space program uh, people who are running them, the American military, CIA, they not only have space travel, they have uh, teleportation. They travel to other planets, not in spaceships, but by teleportation. Um, so this technology is being kept secret from us uh, because main main reason is for control. All right. Um, Amjad Malik says, hello, sir, how are you? May Allah Almighty long live you with good health. Sir, does any solution will be for Kashmir future? Yes, I've talked about this a great deal for even 20 years. <laughs> uh, the Kashmir problem will be solved very easily <laughs> when India and Pakistan uh, realize that the easy way to solve this problem is to give the Kashmiris independence, let them run their own affairs, but the external affairs of Kashmir, because India is not willing to give up Kashmir and Pakistan is not willing to give up Kashmir. So let Kashmir be internally independent. Let the Kashmiris run their own affairs. Withdraw the Indian military. Withdraw the Pakistani military from the Pakistani part of Kashmir also. And let the Kashmiris have their own internal security police force, you may say. Um, but because neither Pakistan nor India is willing to give up Kashmir, uh, Kashmir may remain a state of both. <laughs> it can remain a Pradesh of India uh, and the external affairs of Kashmir, believe it or not, will be run by India and Pakistan together, cooperatively. So therefore I was told, this is 30, not, not, not 30, but more than 20 years ago, a Great Sufi told me, Nafrat ki bais nahi, balke muhabbat ki bais. Kashmir will become not the cause of hatred, but the cause of love. So when, and we see it already starting in Kartarpur. Kartarpur is not far from Kashmir. <laughs> I've said many times, Kartarpur is the beginning of world peace. Kartarpur is Khalistan. It is the real Pakistan. Uh, Khalistan and Pakistan both mean the land of the pure. So the land of the pure has been established now visibly in Kartarpur and the land of love and peace and truth and justice and this will spread to Kashmir because the Indian people themselves are coming to Kartarpur and they're being amazed by the beautiful atmosphere of love. This is Guru Nanak's, Baba Nanak's blessing. <laughs> and when the people of India see this, they will want to have the same thing and the people of Kashmir also and the people of Pakistan also. And the whole of Kashmir will become part of Kartarpur. Uh, it will be both India and Pakistan. It will be a free interchange, an exchange of love and harmony and uh, truthfulness between India and Pakistan. So that's how Kashmir is going to be solved. This was I was told this more than 20 years ago. In fact, I wrote a letter. Almost 20 years ago, I wrote a letter to General Musharraf and to Prime Minister Bajpai uh, that this is the solution to the Kashmir problem. And they actually were working together on a similar solution. Uh, but some people who didn't want the Kashmir problem to be solved, they interrupted that uh, discussion that Bajpai and Musharraf were having. Um, but it will happen anyway in good time. So that definitely is the solution. Okay, let's see. Khadija Zahid. Great lessons, mashallah. Wish you could do it more often. Well, I like to read all four of these books every day, so I will just continue it. I can do it like I'm doing now. Hadi Rizvi Saib, uh, maybe considered for, for me, he's like the poet laureate of Pakistan. Beautiful, beautiful poetry of the most elevated kind. Uh, he also talks about the one creator and one human race. Yes, Hadi Rizvi Sahib, I plan to visit Karachi also and other places in Pakistan within a few months, inshallah. I hope that uh, I already have my visa. In fact, I was planning to come in October, uh, but because of the deteriorating health of my mother-in-law first, uh, I postponed that. Uh, of course, now she passed away last month, a very beautiful and glorious uh, death she had passing on to the next world. Uh, and after that, though, because my good wife had been taking care of her mother, neglecting her own health and her own uh, bad knee that she's had for a couple of years, 
She could not even walk after her mother passed away. She was in a wheelchair for a month, but then she had uh, surgery, knee replacement surgery, about uh, almost three weeks ago now. So my good wife is recovering now, and hopefully within two or three months she will be sufficiently recovered that we will be able to come to Pakistan, and I look forward very much, Hadir Rizvisaib, to seeing you at that time and all my other Pakistani friends. Amjad Malik says, true and fact. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, you are accepting this. <laughs> A lot of people can't accept this idea that there are extraterrestrials even. Even though it's obvious there must be with trillions and trillions of planets, <laughs> there must be some other living beings somewhere. But uh, a lot of people don't accept that. They don't believe it. What to speak of the fact that there have been a secret space program for almost a hundred years. Human beings have been traveling out into space, visiting the moon and Mars and other planets but, uh, and other star systems. But it's true. It is a fact. Thank you very much. I'm Jad Malik Sahib. All right. Uh, let's see. Dean Muhammad says, Sir, what are your thoughts on Qudratullah Sahib? I am, I've heard of Qudratullah Sahib Sahib, and I uh, believe that he is a very deep thinker. I don't know very much about him but I uh, do appreciate whatever I've learned about him. A great seer, great saint. And finally, Amjad Malik says, sad news, may Allah Almighty peace and rest her soul. <laughs> Actually, it's not sad news. It's very wonderful, happy news. I was there, my good wife was there, and my brother-in-law and uh, my wife, my brother-in-law's son and his wife and daughter, we were all there around her bed. And it was extremely beautiful. For several days, my wife and I had been counseling her, coaching her, that now get ready to leave your body. You can go wherever you want. Uh, as you fix your mind on uh, Lord Jesus and Mother Mary, <laughs> I told her that if you want to go to them, you can go to them. If you want to go and be with your husband, fix your mind on him. Because my mother-in-law was a very saintly woman. And I was convinced like that. And her daughter, my good wife, was also counseling her and coaching her. Uh, just like going out of one room through a door into another room. That's what death is. So my mother-in-law was very peaceful. She had always said, ever since I've known her for 10 years, she's always said, and even since before that, before I knew her, she's always said, I'm not afraid of death. She's never been afraid of death. So when that moment came, it was so beautiful. Actually, that morning I was talking with her. Uh, even though she could not really talk, but she could hear what we were saying, and she could understand what we were saying, and she could acknowledge even by sort of blinking her eyes, she would do by to say yes. Uh, I told her that uh, you've had, just like my wife was telling her, you've had a very beautiful wi uh, life, and uh, now it's time. She was 94 years old. Now it's time you can move on, and uh, it's very easy. Uh, so... I was telling her that morning, so if you like, you can go now. You've, we will take care of everything. Don't worry. You have three wonderful children. They'll take care of all your worldly affairs. Now go on to the next world. It will be even more beautiful and wonderful than this one. <laughs> and in fact, I told her, you can go now if you want. Otherwise, your grandson, uh, my, my uh, mother-in-law, had three children, and... Uh, her son, one boy and two girls, her son has two wonderful sons, and uh, Jaden is one of them, Mark Jr. My brother-in-law's name is Mark, so his one son is Mark Jr., the other one is Jaden. So Jaden is coming, I told my mother-in-law. He's coming this morning with his wife and daughter. So if you want to wait for them, you can. Otherwise, you've done completed everything in this lifetime. You've had a beautiful life, and you can go on to a more beautiful life. So she acknowledged that. And then she didn't leave her body at that time. But Jaden arrived with his wife and daughter. And uh, they greeted her, and we were all around her. And then Jaden put on his cell phone a beautiful, some beautiful Christian music. And he's a very religious man, and my mother-in-law also, a very religious woman. So he put on that song, and just at the very moment that song ended, 
I was watching my mother-in-law. She was breathing. She just stopped breathing very peacefully, calmly. She just left just like that. It was very beautiful. It was really glorious. So it was definitely by her own decision that she left her body at that moment. And uh, so it's not sad at all. <laughs> some people criticized uh, me and my wife because there were some pictures of us smiling even. <laughs> we were actually she has left us. Uh, but we were very happy uh, because we knew that she has gone on to a very uh, wonderful, glorious destination. And actually, by her own choice, she left at that moment. It was very obvious. Okay, Hadi Rizvi says, Great, let everybody be okay before you come. Inshallah, all will be well soon. Always in my prayers. Thank you very much for your prayers, Hadi Rizvi Sahib. I always remember you also and appreciate your wonderful and find inspiration in your wonderful poetry and writings also. Uh, so Dean Muhammad, Sir, in how many years Pakistan will be a superpower country, as you always say that? Uh, that is up to you. <laughs> Pakistan will certainly become a superpower country. Not only that, he will, Pakistan will become the leader of the world. Not me, not that I'm only saying this. Uh, Sufi Barkat Ali Sahib, the great saint of the 20th century. Uh, he said that the day will come when the entire world, the United Nations, will turn to Pakistan for guidance. So that certainly will happen. When will it happen? That depends on Pakistanis. <laughs> Pakistan means land of the pure. So as soon as the people of Pakistan become pure, then Pakistan will become the leading country in the world, the spiritual guide of the world. And we see it now actually happening in Kartarpur. Kartarpur is pure Pakistan. It's the Khalis Pakistan and the Pak Khalistan. <laughs> so uh, become Kartarpur. Make your town Kartarpur, that place of love and service. It's incredible. Of course, this has been the focus, might you say, of the Gurdwaras for many centuries. Uh, in the Gurdwaras, the Sikh holy places, uh, the places of worship, houses of worship. Uh, there has been the tradition to serve free meals, uh, very healthy meals to anyone who comes. You can go now to Kartarpur or to any Gurdwara that's functioning and they will give you a free meal. Um, actually twice a day maybe even. <laughs> I've done this in London. I've been to a Gurdwara and with a Pakistani Muslim friend we had a very beautiful meal in a Gurdwara in London. Uh, all over the world where there are Gurdwaras. There's this mood of service, service of God and service of humanity. And of course, reading the Guru Granth Sahib, another scripture which I should probably include. I include these four scriptures. The four largest religions in the world are Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. So I have selected those four scriptures to read. But actually, the fifth largest is Sikhism. So maybe I should add the Guru Granth Sahib also. Guru Granth Sahib is an incredible scripture. Very, very deep, profound teachings there also. Okay, so when Pakistan becomes like the real Pakistan, land of the pure, as we have seen now in Kartarpur, that's when Pakistan will become the superpower. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. And I will try to do this at the same time, since I like to read these scriptures anyway. <laughs> May God protect us all. <laughs>